Well, good day, everybody, and welcome to today's program on the ICDR's amendments to our international arbitration rules and mediation rules as well. Uh, we've been working on this effort for quite a long time, and it's exciting, of course, to be able to roll out our, our amended rules. Uh, and this effort to amend the rules um, has been and was ongoing for over a year. Um, as you might expect, a lot of thought and consideration needed to be given to a set of rules such as the ICDRs, uh, which have international applicability, and we need to make sure they uh, have acceptability and can be enforced internationally. Um, the, the committee of individuals that was involved uh, in the rules drafting effort is a group that we're very proud of. And what's great about today's program is that most of them are here with us and will be helping to explain uh, some of the reasoning and thought behind the rule amendments. Uh, the drafting committee was chaired by Ann Ryan Robertson, um, uh, Alan Crane, both from the US, Beta Gazelle from Poland, uh, Reza Motoshami from England, uh, Lucia Ojeda of Mexico, Anka Sessler from Germany, John Townsend also from the US, and Christine Kang from Beijing. Um, in terms of today's program, we're going to be going through the rule amendments uh, in uh, groups, essentially, uh, issues that impact case management, arbitrators, and parties. Uh, we'll be discussing the expedited procedures, uh, and we will also go through the mediation rule amendments. And you'll hear this theme, I think, a little bit, but we're excited about some of the changes that are happening with regard to mediation and uh, globally. And uh, many of those changes are reflected in the, uh, the, uh, the amendments to those procedures as well. So in terms of the scope, again, this was really a review of the international rules, both arbitration and mediation uh, from beginning to end. Uh, we wanted to ensure that the rule amendments um, uh, captured current practice but also continued with respect to uh, many of the innovations that parties expect from the ICDR. Uh, the map that you're looking at here um, is important because it represents the parties that are involved in ICDR administered cases. And in any given year, there's over 100 countries represented. Uh, parties from around the globe, it goes without saying, uh, engaged in in commerce transactions uh, with parties from the US and other parts of the world. And all of that's reflected in the ICDR caseload. But when it comes to the rules, of course, it gets to this last point that the rules really need to have uh, international acceptability. And we've got to be sure that the principles and procedures and rules that are contained uh, within the procedures are going to be enforceable around the world. Um, the last mediation rule amendment took place in 2008, quite some time ago, and the last arbitration rule amendment took place in 2014. So, of course, it was time um, to engage in that process. The input by uh, individuals was substantial uh, in terms of uh, AAA ICDR management teams. I've mentioned the rules committee itself. A publications committee of the ICDR gave important feedback, and um, we had also feedback from some of the conferences that we've been putting on as this process went along. Uh, a rules amendment process isn't just about drafting the words and amending language. Uh, there's an institution behind the rules, of course, as well, and uh, there's considerable impact in terms of our procedures, making sure staff are aware of changes arbitrators, uh, our parties involving um, and, um, parties involved in our process. Uh, and of course, there's just the infrastructure of making sure that uh, letters, awards, and the rest are also uh, up to date. So again, a, a, a large, significant, important uh, process that we are proud of. And um, the ICDR's translation committee is also in the process of translating all the rule amendments into eight language versions that are uh, being distributed and used throughout the world. 
Um, with that, we're going to um, hand it over to Ann Wright Robertson and Stephen Anderson. Again, Ann was uh, uh, led this effort as chair of this committee. Uh, and they're gonna talk about some of the ICDR's history of innovation, uh, and also just a little bit more detail about the philosophy that uh, was incorporated into the rule amendment process. Anna Steve. Thanks so much, Eric, and thank you for that introduction. As Eric said, uh, this process actually started long before the pandemic hit us. And the impetus for it was simply the updating of the rules to reflect best international practices. In all, it was a 15 month process. And all of the committee members are here today with the exception of Christine Yang and John Townsend who were unfortunately unavailable. And I must say that despite the committee size, which was eight, all of the members were religious in attending our meetings, and it was rare that we did not have a full complement of committee members. As Eric indicated, we were a very diverse group geographically with China, Poland, Germany, England, Mexico, and the United States being represented. That meant that we were from both common law and civil law jurisdictions. And I think also very importantly, we were comprised of advocates who have appeared before tribunals around the globe, arbitrators who are equally experienced in having parties and advocates from a variety of countries appear before them. And two of our members, in addition to having been either advocates or arbitrators, are also former in-house counsel. So the advocates and, and the advocates themselves were a mix of firms from multinational to boutique. So in short, we covered the entire spectrum of arbitration users, practitioners. In approaching the rules revision, each of the committee members not only looked outside its own, their, their own jurisdiction, but also called on their personal experiences, both in international and domestic arbitration to craft what we believe reflects the best international practices. In some instances, one of our committee members would volunteer to draft a rule revision, and then all the revisions were debated vigorously among the committee members. The proposed rules were also vetted internally by the ICDR, as Eric alluded to, with Steve and Eric providing the committee with institutional guidance. And I think one of the most important things was that before the final rules were issued, a draft version was unveiled, unveiled at an ICDR conference with attendees who provided additional comments and suggestions, which in fact were considered by the committee before we reached the final version. I'd like to say in terms of the committee, foremost in our minds was maintaining the integrity and transparency that is so vital to the arbitration process. We believe integrity and transparency to be two cornerstones of the arbitral process. And so today we're going to share with you some of the highlights of the ICDR innovations. And this committee felt a responsibility to maintain this defining characteristic of the ICDR. Steve? Thank you, Ann. I wanna just uh, take a minute. Yeah, Steve, I'm sorry. Uh, I just did want to note also your questions are very important to us. Uh, and, and to the extent you have them, please enter them into the Q&A function. Uh, and uh, we will be getting to them. We, we plan to uh, wait until the, the uh, primary portion of the presentations is over. Uh, but we want to make sure that uh, you, you are aware, we're, we'll welcome your questions, please please enter into that into the Q&A function and uh, we will get to them either at the end of the program or once the program concludes. Thanks, Eric. I uh, just want to take a minute and recognize um, Anne Ryan Robertson for being the chair of this committee. She did a tremendous effort in guiding and leading and uh, keeping us on task through uh, a, you know, a long process, but uh, uh, I really want to thank her and all the committee members. It was a pleasure. One of my roles was the designated representative for ICDR to, to drive this project. And I had the pleasure of working with this committee and also working with our case management team and our executive team and going back and forth and getting feedback and, and uh, 
bringing those two worlds together to bring a, a, a completion, a rule set that was uh, what we have today. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of these philosophies. The idea of preserving current rule language is really important to us. We don't want to make any rule changes without justifying it by another important philosophy or need. And so we, we were able to do that throughout. The idea of maintaining wounds control is what we've had since our inception of uh, as an institution is really uh, maintaining party control and arbitrator authority. And we'll get into this throughout this presentation, but there are a number of additional changes and, uh, and amendments that allow for increased efficiency and economy. And this is really driven by parties and arbitrators supported by the institution. And And in addition to that, on the integrity and transparency, you're going to see that we have some additional rules that we have added relating to such things as third party funding, which we will be discussing. And we have some rule innovation, a lot of it driven by the arbitrator, members of the committee themselves regarding uh, how to efficiently uh, maintain the um, arbitration uh, process. So we're very proud of what we've been able to put together and we hope that you will uh, find what we have come up with to be uh, very cutting edge in many respects. In that uh, spirit of, of our historical, um, I guess, effort to be innovative and to pioneer rules, we wanted to kind of go through some of the quickly highlights of what we've done historically. Then I'm gonna turn the time over to Ann to, show some of the highlights of this last rule change. Uh, we were the first in 2006 to create emergency measures of protection noted. There was a lot of uh, uh, commentary at that time that were questioning whether that would survive and whether that was needed and otherwise. And now today, it's uh, there's really not a rule set that uh, has not accepted that that's um, a major player in the, in the global market. We uh, have long uh, had an, an integrated into our case management process, an early case management conference with parties for, for efficiency and economy and really helping them also our arbitrator list method. In 2008, we were uh, created a document exchange guideline really to help uh, that process. Um, has uh, some, some themes of relevant material uh, document exchange that is similar to what we hear in IBA and uh, it limits the US style discovery. We also created in 14 expedited proceedings that are you know, front loaded filing and provide for our written submissions only for cases under 100,000. A privilege rule also created in 14 that really allows an arbitrator to provide the highest level of protection for privilege among differing level of jurisdictional laws. And lastly, um, providing a consolidation arbor for that issue in 2014. And? Okay. So here are some of what we believe to be pioneering innovations in the new rules, and we'll be exploring these in greater depth, so I will only hit the highlights at this point. You're going to find that we reference cybersecurity, privacy, and data protection in the rules, which is not surprising in view of the uh, life we find ourselves in at the moment where everything is being done remotely. And although it was our opinion that the rules, in fact, as written, did allow for video conferencing hearings, you will see that that in, indeed is included as well in the rules as, as a means of conducting a hearing. You'll find that we have a reference, a direct reference to the Singapore Convention, and we are encouraging concurrent mediation. And in a change in the idea of mediation, previously, it was an opt-in where parties could opt in for mediation. And now you will see in the rules that it is an opt-out procedure. Many of you in the United States are aware of the case of first options by the US Supreme Court that indicated that the tribunal would only be able to determine arbitrability if in fact there had been a delegation of that power to the arbitrators. And although the rules that we had clearly stated that the tribunal had the ability to determine its own jurisdiction, the issue is still somewhat open in the United States because the Supreme Court has not yet addressed the issue of whether referral to rules in of themselves constitutes a delegation of that particular authority. And in fact, the restatement that has been issued on arbitration takes a contrary view 
although every appellate court in the United States to address it has found that reference to rules constitutes a delegation. Nevertheless, in an attempt to make certain that there is no question, there is now an inclusion in the rules relating to the fact that it is not necessary to first refer the matters to the court. And finally, one of the issues that has arisen many times over the years is when one party fails to pay the cost required by the institution. And we have created a rule that allows for a party that has paid the cost of another to in fact seek and obtain an award that will allow them to seek those costs from the other party prior to the conclusion of the arbitration. Thank you, Ann. i turn the time over to uh, Eric for our next few slides here. Thank you. And uh, I will also be turning this over shortly uh, to Tom and Reza, but I will just note that at this point, we're really going to get into the substance of the rule amendments, um, moving from an overview and um, some explanation about our approach to the rule amendments and actually getting into the substance. Um, with respect to the ICDR's case administration, um, at the outset, we thought it was important at this point to also explain to parties uh, when the ICDR might administer a case as opposed to one of our domestic divisions. And this is actually an issue that's a little bit unique to the ICDR because the AAA's caseload is so broad and, and large, quite frankly. Um, and there seemed to be among some organizations and individuals, um, just a question that would come up, where do you draw the line? Uh, where is a particular case when it is filed with the AAA or ICDR, how is it directed to the ICDR as opposed to one of the domestic divisions? And so we've added language to provide clarity. And uh, it's really no surprise that the way we make that decision administratively at the outset, and again, the parties are free to agree to whatever they want, but in the absence of that, the general direction is that an international arbitration uh, will be directed to the ICDR when it meets the definition of international that's contained um, uh, within UNCTRA, um, uh, those rules um, or law. And uh, we're really looking at where the parties are themselves, their places of business are in different countries, uh, where there's performance outside the country of uh, any other party, where the subject matter is outside uh, the country of uh, any party, um, uh, where the place of arbitration, of course, is uh, outside the country of the party. And um, of course, when uh, things can get very complicated when you've got multiple parties uh, with multiple places of business. Uh, but again, we're looking for some nexus that exists uh, in different countries from where the parties are. So uh, again, we thought that was important to add to the rules to provide some clarity. Um, so Tom Ventrone and uh, Reza Motoshami are going to take from here and talk about uh, issues, a number of issues, emergency measures, uh, and also the introduction in our rules to the uh, International Arbitration Review Council. Thank you, Eric. Hello, colleagues. Glad you're able to join us here today for this, uh, for this program. I'm happy to be partnering with uh, Reza on uh, going over a few rules. If you haven't, uh, yet realize we'll be going through most of the rules throughout the program numerically. Uh, so I'll be touching on uh, the first several that uh, we thought warranted some, some conversation. So as you see on the screen, I'm just going to mention articles two and three, uh, the notice arbitration and the uh, rule require um, discussing the answer. And here, and you'll hear it several times throughout the program, uh, we ask, we're asking the parties to state whether they're willing to mediate prior to the arbitration or concurrently. Um, it's not always going to be addressed in, the, addressed in these submissions, and we will discuss them in our case management call. But again, we think mediation is so important and is necessary and is helpful that uh, we'd like them to make a statement on it early. Um, Article three, slight change was just not uh, to uh, allow the parties a full, mostly responded a full 30 days to submit any answer and counterclaim. Uh, quite often the commencement of the arbitration date was in dispute. 
So we clarified it here by just saying that the administrator confirms from the date the administrator confirms receipt of the notice of arbitration. Steve, if you could, I'd uh, like to discuss this is an exciting rule for us. Uh, Article 5, uh, the International Administrative Review Council. There are not many new, completely new rules. This happens to be one of them. Um, many of the rules were amended and, and modified a little bit, but this is a completely new rule. And it refers to what we would term to the International Administrative Review Council or International ARC. Uh, and this group was designed to make determinations, as you see on the screen, regarding challenges to arbitrators, disputes regarding the number of arbitrators to be appointed, whether their parties have met the administrative requirements or administrative jurisdiction to initiate or file an arbitration, and often disputes regarding place of arbitration subject to the power of the tribunal to make a final determination. Uh, why the rule? This process, has been in place since 2018. But in the interest of clarity, in the interest of transparency, um, we decided uh, it was necessary to place it in the rules. Now, as you all, uh, many of you know, the ICDR administers rules under a varied set, administers uh, cases under a varied set of rules. Not only these international rules, but UNCTRAL rules, our ICDR Canada rules, our domestic commercial construction rules, the Administrative Review Council will hear or make determinations on these issues for all rule sets, but this is the only set of rules where it's outlined and, and discussed. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the standards and uh, what, uh, what the parties are directed to do. Uh, on our website, and we'll be sharing the links to those shortly, either in the Q&A or in a follow-up email uh, to the questions posed, standards and guidelines for the parties to follow when they're um, challenging an issue described along the top row here. The, re the filing requirements, number of arbitrators, et cetera. You'll see on the bottom where our decision is final and then where it can go to the tribunal or an arbitrator for final decision under the place of arbitration. This is resolved very early on in the process. Um, it only takes about 10, or 20, 10 to 20 days to get this decision out. Um, we meet once a week. The process is for writ calls for written positions on these issues only. Um, it's an, an, it requires the initial recommendation of the case manager or the director managing that file. We have an open discussion and we make a determination. We do not provide reasoned decisions in any of these uh, issues that are presented. Um, so I, I Again, this has been in place since 2018, so I'd like to ask Rates a question, if I may, and pose a question to him about his thoughts on the process and this addition to the rules. Thanks, Tom. Uh, let me first of all say um, hello and good day to everyone, and, and also to thank the ICDR AAA for organizing this seminar and, and just say what a, uh, what a privilege it was to be part of the rules committee that was expertly led by Anne. Um, Tom, in, in terms of your question and the addition of this rule, I think this is a, a very informative and useful addition. It lifts the curtain on what was, as you say, the ICDR's existing practice and makes that practice transparent by highlighting the involvement of the International Administrative Review Council and the tasks that they may be called upon to play under the arbitration rules. And in that sense, the tasks that they play uh, is somewhat similar to the tasks that um, is played by the ICC court in an ICC arbitration or the LCIA court in an LCIA arbitration in certain respects, such as determining the number of arbitrators or sorting out arbitrator challenges. So all in all, a very positive development. Um, but, but Tom, I had a question for you, if I may, um, on the theme of transparency, which is this. I have searched in vain on the AAA website for a list of the members comprising the International uh, Review Council. Are you able to, to confirm who are the members and how are they designated in each instance whenever the council is called upon to uh, undertake a role? Uh, thanks, Rachel. Thank you for the question. Great question. Um, yes. Uh, as the, 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 the individuals on the screen that you see uh, in front of you today, the executives of the ICDR, 
have all at one time or another sat as a member of the review council. The council itself in a rotating manner, depending on availability, types of cases, what your prior involvement in that case might have been, uh, consists of three individuals, two executives of the ICDR and a former executive of the AAA ICDR. At present, uh, it consists, uh, our third member is the former general counsel of the AAA, Marisa Peterson. And she provides an external view and position, uh, but someone who's very experienced in the administration of cases and in arbitration in general. So that's who the, uh, the players are. Um, we may consider posting a little bit more about that. It is in the overview, but more in general terms and not specific names as you might have with a court where it's a list of names that then gets rotated. It, it is, uh, as I described, internal um, AAA staff, ICDR staff, along with our a single external provider. Uh, I think we should uh, move on in the interest of time. Um, here's article six regarding mediation. And I do just want to read the last part of this sentence to you. I will not be discussing mediation, but I am very pleased with this addition. We have seen this work. This is exciting. And as you can see, it says the parties shall mediate their dispute pursuant to the ICDR's international mediation rules. So when we have our administrative call with the parties, we are proactively advising them they will mediate and we will help them mediate unless they agree not to or one of the parties opts out. But we really need to share at that point the benefits and the value that we have seen from our experience in mediating and why we're requesting that they go through the process. Um, as mentioned earlier in the earlier rule, it can be concurrent. We could stop the arbitration process and just run a mediation first. How, and there are different ways to do these, uh, the process, but we are excited about it and you'll hear more about it later. Um, Right, so any thoughts on, 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 on mediation becoming a requirement of the process? Yeah, I, I think, again, this is a really positive development. It, it's certainly a, a notable addition to the rules. As you say, it's unique to the ICDR. Certainly, I'm not aware of any other set of international rules that have this provision. And it's really helpful because it prompts the parties to consider mediation in circumstances where may they where they may not have not have given it any thought. So in that sense, it can only be a a, a net positive. Um, but Tom, again, let me ask you a, a question. And I appreciate its early days so far under the new rules. But do you have a sense as to how often the parties have chosen not to opt out, not to elect out of mediation, and to to give it a go? I, uh, again, great question. I don't have any hard numbers to provide, but we're, because we're still at the early stage, the majority still opt out. Once that claim is filed, that party might want to take that stand. Uh, before this, we were making the offer. You were not required to mediate, but we were making the offer and trying to persuade them to do so. Uh, generally speaking, under all sets of rules, is all sets of rules, um, less than pr uh, probably about 15% of the parties will, will attempt mediation. But of that 15%, we're going to see more than 80% settlement rate. And those are the, some of the numbers we share. Uh, and this goes back years and years, this general number uh, uh, in history. Uh, but it's early on and we hope more experience with our administration and with these rules, parties will be more encouraged to do so. And, or at least even, a better option is putting it in your clause and having that mediation step in your clause. Okay, uh, I think we can move on, Steve. Uh, I'll be brief on Article 7. Steve mentioned uh, we were the first to uh, launch an emergency measures of protection rule. Uh, the, the amendments to this rule, uh, just to tighten it up a little bit, uh, it, it has worked. We have seen over 125 cases to date. Um, the process usually takes under three weeks. 
you'll see in the second bullet here, uh, we just wanted to clarify uh, the, that the reasons needs to be made uh, why you're requesting emergency relief before the tribunal's appointed, why you're likely to be found to entitle to such relief, and what injury or prejudice the party will suffer if relief is not provided. Um, it just tightens up the process and gives a little more direction to the party filing that emergency application. Right, sir? Any experience with emergency, whether our rules or otherwise, and your thoughts on it? Yeah, not not so far under the under the ICDR rules. Just just a couple of uh, very brief observations on this. I, again, I think these are very useful changes made to Article Seven One, which provide good guidance as to what should be covered in an emergency arbitrator application that's filed with the uh, with the center with the administrator. And the rules I've noticed are very prescriptive in this regard. In the, in the same way that the rules set out what should be covered in a notice of arbitration under Article Two. Here, they're very prescriptive as to what should be covered in an emergency arbitrator application. And I think that's really helpful, uh, especially for parties who have limited experience or no experience uh, in making an emergency arbitrator application. And then my second brief observation uh, is, is that the addition, that uh, last bullet you see on the slide, which is an additional requirement in Article 7.1, I think is really important. It, it captures the um, the balance of convenience test, which is commonly considered by arbitrators as part of an interim measures application. And I think in this context, will really assist the administrator in determining whether to go ahead and appoint an emergency arbitrator. So a, a, a valuable addition. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Steve, you could just advance the slide. There'll, there'll be a, a slide with some numbers uh, through December, 2020. And I just wanna make a quick comment on one of Race's remarks. We, we often, you have to be reminded when drafting rules that the level of sophistication of counsel in the process itself is not always the same. Uh, we we sit on these programs and, and, our, and people are very familiar with international arbitration. That's not often the case. Council may came in, they're representing a party, but they have no familiarity with arbitration itself, never mind international arbitration or any other specific set of rules. And so we need to be there for them to help them manage the process. So, so this type of clarification is, is what was in mind when, when we move forward. Uh, lastly, I'm just going to uh, touch on uh, two sets of uh, two rules that we uh, incorporated in 2014 the joinder and consolidation rules. Um, Steve, if you want to just advance that slide. Uh, you'll see there's some, some minor additions, again, tightening up the rules in joinder. There's been some discussion about the unclarity of, of when parties could request joinder and um, at what point the, their, uh, the joinder um, request needs to be considered and by what tribunal. So this just language, I encourage you to review it. The same thing with our uh, consolidation. We just talked about related parties because the, the limitation of same parties seemed to be a, a questionable issue. Uh, but I think that's where we'll stop here. I'll thank Razor for his comments as well. And I want to turn it over to uh, Luis Martinez and uh, Lucia Ojeda, who will uh, take it up from here. Colleagues? Thanks, Tom, and uh, really a pleasure to be with all of you. A shame it couldn't be in person, but um, I do think as what happened in 2014, we discussed those revisions extensively at, con at conferences, and we had the valuable feedback over time, and we'll be looking for similar feedback as these rules continue to be adopted in our international cases. So starting off with Article 14, uh, we, again, focusing on transparency, we included the language in that uh, the arbitrators in, as part of their appointment packages, when they sign their oath, they do agree to the code of ethics for arbitrators in commercial disputes. We had been doing that for some time, but again, we wanted to make sure that the rules reflect every administrative step that we're doing behind the scenes so everyone is clear on the rules uh, that are being applied and what we're doing as part of the ICDR system. Under the impartiality and independence section of the rules, we added a new article that deals with the issue of third-party funding. 
which as we all know is clearly part of the international arbitration landscape. Um, the ICDR has a broad disclosure policy, including placing disclosure obligations on the parties. We do not in fact apply the IBA guidelines on the conflict of interest. Uh, our position is really disclose everything, give the parties an opportunity to object to the disclosure or waive it. And that really reduces the potential for mischief later on. Uh, there's nothing worse than going through a full case, spending all the money that we spend on these cases and the parties and uh, having the award attack later on for a disclosure issue that was not properly made. And the idea behind this particular inclusion of the rule is to disclose a possible economic interest uh, that someone may have in the outcome of the arbitration. We wanna identify the person or entity behind it. You really wanna be careful to avoid uh, a situation where that disclosure was not made. And um, the idea is that the tribunal can actually on its own initiative or a party as well, after consulting with the parties, requests that the third party funder or uh, another entity make the appropriate disclosure. Now, Lucia, can you let us know if the committee considered what an arbitrator should ask the parties when consulting with them about their interest in having the existence of a third party funder or other uh, disclosed? W what do you do if they both object and also, did the committee consider any standards or further guidance on really what constitutes an economic interest? Well, thank you. Thank you, Luis. First of all, I, I would like to thank the ICDR for inviting me to participate in the seminar and, of course, to form part of the, of the committee. Uh, with respect to your question, of course, as you pointed out, this amendment is very much in line with modern trends in international arbitration to address concerns of uh, concerned voices about third party funding and, and parties with another economic interests involved as a potential conflict of interest. Without doubt, these additions provide transparency and protect at the end the integrity of the arbitration procedure. Uh, as you said, it is important to note that now the tribunal has expressed and discretional power to require the parties to disclose. Uh, as, we, as we said, the rationale behind this provision is a sound one. It's the need to preserve arbitration's impartiality and, the, and independence. In light of this, I believe, of course, it, it is important that the tribunal uh, request the, the, the opinion of the parties on this consult. But I believe it will be rare that both parties object to such disclosure. But at any event, the arbitral tribunal may order the disclosure anyway, if it believes that it, it, it is appropriate. Let's remember that the system and its integrity depends up substantially on the role of the institutions, the transparency and the arbitrations. In this case, uh, the tribunal has a duty to take whatever steps are necessary to protect the integrity of the arbitra arbitral process and uh, fulfill their duty to render an enforceable uh, hour. So I think that this is an, 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 an interesting um, poss possibility, but I think that, that if, it's, if it's needed, uh, of course, the, the, the tribunal shall request the disclosure. Uh, with respect to the second point, the tribunal may request, of, as you say, to disclose the existence of um, non-party with an economic interest. Um, this is, uh, for example, this is such as a funder, an insurer, a parent company, or ultimate beneficial owner. This will may also cover insurance agreements. For example, when third parties and a party are part of a group of companies forming one and, this, uh, and the same economic reality as well as the non-signatory third party being involved in the negotiations, performance, or termination of the contract, this is important to know. Uh, the economic interest of the parties involved in the transaction, um, it's, it's, it's key to, 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 to try to understand the, 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 the potential conflict of interest. Of course, uh, various stakeholders are likely to raise questions and potential concerns about this provision, but, as, but as, as I just stated, I think that the rationale behind this provision is a sound one. And of course, we, we, don't, we don't want to uh, uh, make this process uh, tortuous, but I think that it's important to try to, to identify all economic interests in order to, to, to protect the integrity of the, of the procedure. All right, thanks, Lucia. Let's uh, move on to the next slide, please, Steve. 
So this one here is really lessons learned from our 2014 rules. You, as you know, previously all challenges were limited where a party believed there were justifiable doubts as to the arbitrator's impartiality or independence. Our problem was that we experienced cases where a challenge was needed and it didn't fit neatly into the definitions of impartiality or independence. So we needed to expand uh, the categories to add for failing to perform the uh, arbitrator's duties. And uh, there were situations that fitted into that category that uh, we think will be helpful. And we also needed the possibility to remove an arbitrator, the ICDR, for failing to perform as well. So uh, as the administrator, we were not blocked by again having to have all these lack of performances, if you will, falling into the impartiality and independence issue. We needed to expand that accordingly. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. So tribunal secretaries as well, another issue that uh, we have seen and being used, obviously in international arbitration. And here we put a placeholder, uh, if you will, that the tribunal may appoint an arbitral tribunal secretary, but they'll have to serve in accordance with the ICDR guidelines. We are working on those guidelines now and uh, they should be out soon. Obviously the devil's in the details, looking at issues such as how will the request be made? We don't want to put the parties in an awkward position of perhaps having to decline the request uh, that is being made by the eventual decision makers. We'll look at the disclosures of the tribunal secretary, how compensation will be handled. And I think an important component will be their role. I've had some cases where the tribunal secretary is conducting research. Well, what type of research? What exactly are they doing? Or is it just administrative tasks? Uh, we hope that the guidelines will address those issues and how to use them properly. Uh, now, Article 21, and mentioned, I think it's a really an important article. Arbitral Tribunal has the authority to decide issues of arbitrabilities without the need to refer such matters first to a court. Uh, as Anne correctly stated, we're having this issue here in this jurisdiction where the restatement has said that, yes, tribunals can rule on their own jurisdiction, but absent a clear and unmistakable agreement by the parties, it's really not exclusive of a court's authority to consider the question. And the restatement re really takes the position contrary to the case law and what we had all considered is that inclusion of a set of arbitration rules in your arbitration agreement is not an exclusive delegation and does not in fact constitute a clear and unmistakable delegation. So it is an issue. I think the committee took the position that went as far as the arbitral institution could go. But uh, Lucia, I'll turn to you. What did the committee consider regarding the inclusion of this article, especially when you consider the non-US jurisdictions? Yeah, well, that, that, that's true, Luis. Uh, this issue was well discussed in the committee as something relevant given the development and evolution of the US case law and decisions. Um, uh, in fact, in the ICDR's Americans Conference held last uh, year, uh, when revisions to Article 21 were discussed before their adoption, there was some confusion about, uh, among international lawyers in the session about the reasons of, for this change. Uh, nevertheless, that change can be considered prudent in light of the patchwork of uh, judge uh, made law in the United States that controls when a threshold issue of arbitrability is for judicial determination or for an arbitration to decide. Uh, of course, uh, we believe, I mean, we discussed that it's, it's Article 21, it's intended to avoid any doubt that under the principles of competence, competence incorporated in the ICD roles, arbitrators may have the jurisdiction to rule on their own jurisdiction and proceed with uh, arbitration if they uphold it without a court ruling. Of course, this is something, as I said, that maybe uh, uh, international lawyers may think that it's obvious, but uh, I believe this is important because uh, since, since major uh, procedures involve US parties or, or, or US points of, of contact, I think that that's important and prudent to have it in the rules. Thank you, Lucy. I'll be interested to see how this rule is uh, played out and accepted and discussed at uh, further conferences. I'll turn it over to Mira and Alec. 
Thank you, Louise. So um, let me first, before Maris talks about the changes we made to Article 22 and the corresponding changes to Article 26, emphasize that no change was made to what I call the clause paramount. Article 22, of course, is the conduct of proceedings article. And Article 22.1 says and still says that the tribunal may conduct the arbitration in whatever manner it considers appropriate, provided that the parties are treated with equality and that each party has a right to be heard and is given a fair opportunity to present its case. Now, I'll refer a bit more to that later when we get to another article. Mara, did you want to speak some more to the, the changes we made? Alan, thank you. And uh, thank you to all attendees for the interest in this presentation. And yes, indeed, the tribunal in the ICD arbitration has many important responsibilities. And one of them is to conduct the arbitration efficiently. So let's look at the amendments related uh, first to technology, uh, which is a viable tool to increase efficiency in uh, modern arbitration. By the way, the use of technology is not something new to the ICDR rules. Um, their prior version in 2014, um, underscoring the need for the speed and economy, already talk about technology. So the new rules through the articles on conduct of the proceeding and the hearing now expressly reference video, audio, and other electronic means as alternatives to in-person proceedings. Recently, we all experienced COVID-19 literally pushing arbitration online. Um, thousands of the AAA ICDR uh, hearings, oral arguments, um, procedural conferences took place virtually on various platforms. A virtual hearing has certainly gained trust of the arbitration practitioners. Of course, it um, uh, may not be um, applicable or necessary in, e in each arbitration, and my colleagues will touch on this later on in this presentation. However, from what we've seen, uh, virtual technology is here to stay. At the ICDL, we continue to serve as a um, resource to our users, whether you need a virtual hearing guide or model order, or um, you want to reserve facility with video conferencing technology for um, a virtual or a hybrid hearing, of course, we are well equipped uh, to assist you. Now, with the increased use of technology uh, comes the increased concern about cybersecurity and data protection. Uh, taking steps to secure systems, networks, devices, uh, to protect unauthorized access to uh, personal and case data or um, ensuring compliance with data privacy law from various jurisdictions. These are the topics that we here, the arbitration community is discussing while we continue to debate um, how best to respond to these challenges here at the ICDL, we're also trying to do something about it in connection with a specific case. And um, you may see the arbitration provision uh, 22.3 that establishes the duty of the tribunal to discuss with the parties cybersecurity, privacy, and data protection. Um, of course, uh, giving the arbitrators procedural roles, uh, powers, as well as duty to confidentiality they are best positioned to take lead on raising these issues with the parties. The rules envision that such discussion take place early on in the process at the procedural hearing, which is actually the first meeting of the tribunal and the parties. Uh, moving to the next slide. To help um, all involved in the arbitration to get ready for uh, this discussion, the ICD created two documents. Um, if you've had the already ICD arbitration, you've probably seen them by now. Uh, these are best practice guide for maintaining cybersecurity and privacy and cybersecurity checklist. The guide includes a suggested topic for discussion at the procedural hearing for the parties and arbitrators. For example, does the case require enhanced level of cybersecurity and data protection? How do participants plan 
to security exchange and store documents. How these documents be destroyed? Um, cybersecurity checklist is a list of activities that promote good tech hygiene uh, habits. Use of antivirus software on your device. Avoid using free personal email for case communications. These are, these are some recommendations that included uh, on that list. Now, we send these documents to the parties when we initiate the arbitration and to the arbitrators when we appoint them to the office. Uh, to bring even more visibility to um, uh, the importance of cybersecurity data, data protection and um, data security, we revised our procedural hearing agenda to make sure it is uh, a topic on for the arbitrators and the parties to consider. Additionally, we assist our arbitrators uh, to sharpen their cybersecurity skills. We have created online trainings. We conducted several in-person workshops prior to COVID on technology and cybersecurity. Um, also recognizing that cybersecurity is a shared responsibility here at the AAA ICDR, we are taking extensive measures to protect our data and technology as well as uh, to practice secure case administration. I can go on and on on that. And in the interest of time, I'm just gonna put a link to where you can find more information on our website in the chat. And now I'm turning to um, Alan for comments on cybersecurity and technology from a perspective of the experienced ADR practitioners, as well as um, introducing early disposition article, which is another tool to promote procedural efficiency in the ICD arbitration. Alan? Thank you, Mayor. So on the cybersecurity, um, we all are uncomfortable uh, every day about cybersecurity. So the tribunal needs to be clear and be sure the parties have a discussion. Most of the cases I hear, the parties are fairly large, the issues are large and they have sophisticated counsel, but sometimes I am surprised that they haven't really engaged on that. So when I sit as chair, I drive that discussion. So if the parties aren't doing it themselves, then I strongly encourage those who sit as arbitrators to do, to do that. It is important. And if you're a party or a client, make sure that happens because we don't want uh, cases to have trouble around cybersecurity. Um, we have enough problems or we wouldn't be in an arbitration. Let me turn to the next slide and talk about early disposition. Uh, I would mention that all three of the other sets of rules of the AAA ICDR so the AAA commercial rules, the employment rules, the construction rules all have an early disposition se section. Um, the ICDR rules did not have this. Um, Ann Robertson mentioned, and I really was pleased to be on this panel with, with her to write these rules and everybody else we had from around the world, um, that we work quickly to put together drafts. I wrote this one together with John T Townsend. Uh, he and I also wrote the one on, he took the lead on that on jurisdiction. And what we did was to really canvas the world and canvas the law that's applicable. And I mentioned earlier when we were talking about Article 22, the importance of having the parties heard at all times. So the balance against the concern that some arbitrators have, if we issue an early disposition order, a party will argue they didn't have the opportunity to put their case on. We feel there are uncomfortable, very comfortable ground with this across the world. And it's important. As I say, it's applicable if an issue well, there's two tests, and let me look at it this way. First, the tribunal allows a party to submit an application for early disposition, so just their application. If the tribunal determines that the application has a reasonable possibility of succeeding, a reasonable possibility, will dispose of or narrow one or more issues in the case, and the consideration of the application is likely to be a more efficient and economical than leaving the issue to be determined at the merits. So it's a three-part examination the parties need to make their case on that before it will even be considered. And then both parties have the opportunity to be heard, a fair opportunity to present the case regarding whether or not the application should be heard, and if permission to make the application is given, whether disposition should be granted. So to meet the standards that I mentioned earlier in, in Article 22.1, to be sure that due process is met in doing this. Um, so that's a very important area. Uh, Mira, are there any comments you want to make on this section as well? Uh, yes, thank you, Alan. Um, even before this article, of course, we've seen arbitrators under certain 
circumstances dismissing specific issue in a claim or counterclaim prior to any hearing on the merits. Um, this amendment that gives express power to tribunals uh, to narrow the disputed issue early on in the process. And of course, Ellen, as you said, providing clear standards for the application should be welcomed by the stakeholders. Absolutely. And uh, with this, I am uh, turning to Steve and Bader to review the rules of the amendments. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I uh, just look around here. I see that I remember that Anka took the lead on our cybersecurity provisions and uh, and we'll get to a, a rule here that Beta took the lead on. So it's been a fascinating project in this. Uh, then with hearing, we're, we're in a new world with hearings. And uh, uh, we, as, as mentioned, we, were, we started this in, endeavor before the pandemic, and uh, but have been able to really rethink some things. And I think this rule uh, tells that story. Uh, and so, you know, we have a great balance here, party agreement and tribunal authority and involvement. And so, I just want to uh, you know, go to, uh, to, to Beta here and just get your thoughts. What is the balance here of this rule between party control and tribunal uh, management uh, in a hearing process? Thank you, Stephen. Um, I think that this is very important to emphasize that we have started to work on these rules, on these uh, amendments when there was really uh, quite a beginning of the pandemic. And the uh, and the, the rule of the uh, remote hearings uh, were just discussed, and I think that we were also growing with this discussion. Uh, I think what should be emphasized also is that most of the actions, well, a lot of actions in arbitration before the pandemic were done in a remote way, processing of the request to arbitration, appointment or uh, confirmation of arbitrators, the, uh, the organizational um, uh, meetings before the hearings, that was a lot done already in advance. And when the pandemic started, then the question of the hearings uh, started to be a vital question. Uh, and uh, there were two, there were two uh, standpoints uh, in this respect. The first one was that the uh, remote hearing is against the party right to be heard. And the second one, uh, because the physical presence of the witnesses uh, of the parties and the tribunal was essential to this right. And the second one, the second option was that it does not require the right to be heard to be exercised properly does not require the physical presence of all of these actors in the, in the proceedings. As long as such hearing is oral and is synchronic so that everybody can be uh, heard in the same, uh, in the same uh, moment. And I think that this, this, what we have in our article 26, right now it's not stormy uh, um, article because I think it is right now quite accepted. Even if we look at the uh, different court decisions all over the world, and there is a few now, uh, which confirm that this second stance uh, was the proper one, especially uh, during the pandemic time when we did not know really how the pandemic will develop, how will this evolve, and how we will be able to, uh, to create our physical hearings uh, in any uh, foreseeable um, future. So this, this uh, our uh, wording of this article allows first the parties to agree on that, but if the parties do not agree, the tribunal can make a determination and it is not by definition treated to be as a unfair trial uh, um, presence. So this, what is right now the, uh, the, um, uh, the wording here accepted is that this every time, this is the particular situation which is taken into consideration. So as a rule, the tribunal making the uh, remote hearings is not against the, uh, the, um, the third trial principle. On the other hand, in the given circumstances, there could be a situation that uh, such a hearing cannot be uh, organized and determined. And I think that we see, uh, as arbitrators, we see that this uh, remote hearing uh, issue was taken by the parties 
in order to derail the proceedings, saying the most, uh, the most common argument which I met in my practice was that remote hearing that is not fair because the parties are from the different time zones. That was even taken into consideration in the recent Vismut uh, exercise. So this shows that the tribunal can organize, can order uh, remote hearings, but must take into consideration the particular uh, circumstances of the case. Thank you, Beto. Well, well said. And, and I think it shows kind of really the thought process and the complexity of what our committee went through. Thank you. Let's go on to uh, um, another part of the hearing. And one of the other kind of sub themes or things I see in our rules are what I call benchmarks. And we have benchmarks for document exchange. And, and this is one here that is a changed benchmark from may to should on written, written, written statements. And so we are really encouraging tribunals to manage and parties to, to make these witness statements um, during the process for economy and efficiency. And so that's um, a frame. I want to ask you, Beta, we're, we're in a COVID world and we're you know, hopefully transitioning into a, a post COVID uh, world. And, and so I wanted to see kind of uh, how does this authority here and in this uh, lower language give uh, to the tribunal kind of to make an order or reduce weight help? How does that help the process in, uh, in, in what we're looking at? Well, you know, uh... It sounds very restrictively when we see that may has been replaced by should. And I think that uh, in this amendments, this is not the first time we have been uh, speaking just a, a minute ago about mediation, that it should come into place. So here to say that evidence of witnesses should be presented in the written statements. However, if we read the first, the first part, it is unless otherwise agreed by the parties or directed by the tribunal. So what is, what is here the, uh, uh, the value, which is uh, uh, of this new wording. I would say that there is right now the, uh, it is confirmed, the practice which is really done in the arbitration. Uh, it means in arbitration, the witness, uh, the witness statements are very, uh, very popular. And truly speaking, in my practice, I have never been in a situation that such witness statements were not uh, prepared in writing first they help organize all the proceedings. So here it is confirmed such a practice. It says that, yes, it should be as a rule, it should be presented in writing and you can depart from this rule only on as a default um, default mode, I would say. So this is how, how, I, how I see it. Okay, excellent. Let me go on to uh, this uh, last uh, slide between us. And um, as I mentioned, uh, you were the one that took the lead on this rule and actually had uh, uh, made some strong arguments why this should be incorporated. So I'd love your thoughts on, on kind of why you feel it's important and uh, in its structure. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think I must say that this is my beloved uh, amendment. <laughs> really, truly speaking, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, pushing very much to, to, to work it uh, out. And uh, now, when you look at the, uh, at the other rules like LCIA, you see that this, uh, this uh, possibility has been introduced already. But again, when we are back, you know, like in really a number of months ago, that was uh, something very, very new and very innovative. I was faced by myself in my practice that I was supposed to uh, sign the award when the uh, lockdown started. And the lockdown started and uh, nobody knew how long will it take. And we were after two years proceedings and we were at the moment of finishing the award. And then we have discussed, I came to the uh, conclusion that I can sign it by a qualified signature. Uh, there is a, in the European Union, there is a regulation, ADAS regulation, which uh, explains what is this uh, electronic signature, the qualified one and replace the, uh, other written signatures. So we have discussed this uh, with the other arbitrators and with the uh, administration of the court where this uh, award was to be issued. And uh, we have come to the conclusion, uh, and I was uh, working this out quite thoroughly, that this is a possibility, that this is very important, especially in such situations like uh, the situation we, which we are facing now. 
And um, I came uh, uh, to the conclusion, as I said, that electronic signature is allowed, at least in the uh, jurisdictions. I was working uh, on the Polish jurisdiction, but uh, I was also uh, working out the problem based on the uh, ancestral model law regulations. In most of the uh, jurisdictions, the requirement of a written signature of a uh, signing um, in writing uh, of the uh, of the award is required. But based on the ancestral model law, this requirement of being in writing is perfectly secured by the proper signa electronic signature. If such signature safeguards uh, the, uh, I did the, the problem of identification of the signatory of the um, uh, of the completeness of the document and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Everything, everything what is required by this ADAS uh, regulation. And we have taken uh, this standpoint as a starting point for this uh, article. And we have decided that uh, the, because of the international character of the uh, of the ICDR, uh, we have to think uh, globally that there are different regulations in different uh, jurisdictions as concerning the electronic signature. For example, in Dubai, we know that the signature is allowed. In other countries, it can, it can be prohibited. And uh, then we have decided that first the parties may uh, may decide that their award can be signed electronically. And if not, this is the arbitral tribunal or administrator. And uh, the reason why it was left with the decision also of the administrator, it was to give the full, uh, the full picture uh, to research uh, whether in the place where the award is going to be recognized and uh, enforced, uh, such uh, electronic signature will not be an impediment to this process. So. Uh, the, the practice uh, should go in this way, at least it was the, 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 it was the uh, designed uh, by the authors of this uh, article, that after analysis of the uh, framework, of the legal framework where the award is going to be recognized, first, that this is the, 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 um, the, the, um, the, such a possibility can be decided. Wonderful, thank you, Beta. I appreciate your involvement. Um, just wrapping up on, on this slide, um, point four, we've talked about a little bit, giving the opportunity for parties to to uh, have an award uh, during the case if they're having to front for the arbitrator compensation deposit for the other. And we think this is innovative and pioneering. We went through a number of versions and Reza uh, one day came up with a, a concise, quick, clean version that uh, we think is really good and, and clean. And so, it tells, again, it gives another option in the process for economy and efficiency and balance. With that, let me turn the time over to Eric. Thank you, Steve. And that set of uh, amendments that have been discussed uh, really encapsulates those changes that have made to the arbitration rules themselves um, that are applicable to most cases, of course, we have separate procedures for expedited cases and the attention given to those procedures, I think in the ADR community generally, um, has, has been the focus of um, more attention. Um, the reason of course, is that parties are finding that expedited procedures um, can be and can be very, uh, they're, they're easily applicable uh, to cases with larger claims and they really, serve the promise of providing some substantial uh, cost and time efficiencies. And so, again, at this time, when we're looking at our rules and procedures, we wanna make sure that the expedited procedures um, also receive the appropriate amount of attention and updating. Uh, and Lewis and Anka will take us through those amendments. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Steve, let me just touch upon quickly the one other rule that I think is uh, very worthwhile mentioning. We did already in the 2014 version have the ability to publish awards that have become public during the course of enforcement or otherwise. But in this revision, we took it a step further and added verbiage that absent uh, the objection of a party within six months of our sending them the award, 
the ICDR will in fact be able to publish those awards accordingly. Now, I was reminded as early as yesterday in a call with in-house counsel that uh, they want to be sure that we're not going to move forward and publish awards unless we expressly hear from them that they do not in fact object. And that's the approach we're taking. It's not meant to be a gotcha moment. We will reach out to them during the administrative process and make sure they have an opportunity to object. But it's really our hope that this will increase the pool of these wonderfully drafted awards in sectors all over uh, in various industries that would really be helpful, I think, uh, to promote international arbitration. Let me move on to the next slide on the expedited procedures. Not major revisions done there. The main thing was increasing the threshold from 250,000 to 500,000. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, we can look at the roadmap of how these cases play out. The threshold is 500,000. Written submissions only is for cases 100,000 or less. There are some of the milestones. We do ask for some detailed submissions upon filing, more so than in a regular track, because the arbitrator is going to need to make some early decisions and needs to have a better understanding of the case before them. All the time frames are accelerated from arbitrator appointment to when the procedural hearing takes place. And in fact, in 2014, we included deadlines for the awards. So if you're going on the written submission track only, the award is gonna be due within 30 days uh, from the last submission in writing, or if a hearing takes place, which we don't necessarily encourage, but it's actually easier now with the virtual hearings that we're doing so much more uh, as a consequence of COVID, uh, the award is due within 30 days from the close of hearing. So it is really a fast track process. You can see how many cases are being used under the expedited procedures on our infographics. And um, I think it's playing out nicely. Anka, I'd like to know, what is your view on not only just the increasing of the threshold, but what matters are suited for expedited proceedings? And really what makes the ICDR rules for expedited proceedings special as perhaps compared to other fast track rules? Thank you very much, Luis, and hello to everyone. Yeah, so I think the expedited procedure is really a great tool, and, and I think that the increase of the threshold amount um, is, is a very good decision. Um, the increase, I think, will lead to more cases being subject to the expedited uh, procedure provisions, and um, the key advantage of expedited procedures are saving time and money, and these advantages are particularly important as regards um, smaller cases. And yeah, are they, uh, to what matters are they um, suited? And of course, the simple answer is to, to smaller cases. Um, but of course, I think it's important to, to note that the amount in dispute should not be the only factor that determines whether expedited proceedings apply. And this is, as you all know, because the value of the claim does not necessarily reflect the complexity of the underlying dispute. Um, high value claims may address narrow legal issues and thus may be well suited for expedited proceedings. On the other hand, we have all seen low value claims that may address complex issues or may require extensive taking of evidence or document production. And these are issues that hardly fit in the schedule of expedited proceedings. Um, therefore, I think that the ICDR rules have found a good balance in so far as they stipulate a threshold amount, the US dollar 500,000, but also provide for other factors to play a role in determining when the expedited procedure shall apply, such as that the parties may agree to opt out or in of the expedited um, procedure. Yeah, and then I think also the ICDR has been uh, quite um, creative in that they contain two features and I think very useful features that uh, at least as far as I know are not found in most other expedited procedure rules. And, and that is first article one, para four, last sentence that calls, and Luis has mentioned it briefly, uh, for documents only or submissions only proceedings, if no party's claim or counterclaim exceeds uh, 100,000 US dollars. 
Um, and this applies unless the arbitrator determines that an oral hearing is necessary. Most other arbitration rules do not contain such a presumption for documents only proceedings based on a threshold amount. Uh, they rather merely state that the arbitrators in consultation with the parties may decide whether there shall be an oral hearing in an expedited proceeding or whether the expedited proceedings shall be conducted on a documents only basis. And that of course needs also some time um, to, to figure out. Um, yeah, and um, then there is second um, article E6, um, the appointment process um, of the sole arbitrator who is in charge of the expedited proceedings. And um, this appointment process is based on a list uh, approach. And uh, I like this very much because it's an interesting combination of both um, the arbitral institution and the parties choosing uh, the arbitrator. And um, at least my experience shows that uh, a list approach usually guarantees, on the one hand, a rather quick arbitrator appointment. On the other hand, even though a party or even both parties may not end up with their number one candidate, the parties usually still have some influence on who will be the person that decides their dispute. And I think that of course creates um, trust in, in the process um, and is I think uh, therefore a very, very good move of the ICDR. And with that, I hand it back to you, Luis. Thank you, Anka. And I will hand it over to Eric. Thank you. And we now move to um, our mediation rule amendments. And I said at the beginning of our program this morning that um, this is an area where we think um, there are some exciting developments. You've already heard a bit about this, uh, but to take us through really in more detail uh, is Michael Lee, uh, who is joining us from our Singapore Case Management Center. Uh, and of course, we wanna emphasize uh, the importance of our presence there. Um, this is a fully functioning office uh, with a great staff experience uh, with a lot of expertise um, in dispute resolution. Um, uh, Mike will tell you a bit, a bit more about that, but I just want to emphasize that, uh, you know, Michael's interaction with the rest of the ICDR team now and his, his staff in Singapore is seamless. Uh, we really offer um, uh, case management administration services in, uh, now we can say, uh, I, I'm reluctant to say around the clock, uh, because it does mean that somebody's always got to be available. But there have been times where we've had uh, hearings taking place where we're able to hand off uh, management of the virtual proceedings, uh, which are taking place well into the middle of the night um, on the East Coast to our Singapore office. And uh, it, it all works very well. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Michael Lee uh, will be talking about the mediation rule amendments with Anne Ryan Robertson. All right, um, it's great to see you all. Um, Steve, can we stay on this slide for a little while? Uh, as Eric mentioned, I'm joining you from Singapore. Uh, it's about 1.20 a.m. here. That makes Japan, Korea about two uh, in the morning and three in the morning for Australia about 11.30 in, um, 10.30, 11 uh, in India. So basically a substantial part of the world is sleeping. So I volunteered to represent Asia because people who might disagree with me are all sleeping, I'm hoping. <laughs> and I'll take you to Asia and perhaps uh, update you on our Asia initiative. Uh, we have been in Asia since 20, uh, 2007, 2008. And over the years, we realized that a representative office, although important and became a model for a lot of other institutions now, wasn't going to be enough anymore. Opening an office for the sake of opening an office or to establish a mere presence was not really helping the parties in practical sense there needed to be a degree of presence, a real presence. So how do you really serve global communities with very limited business hours, as Eric mentioned? And you have an American party on one side and Asian party or from parties from Europe on the other, and we're only open for American business hours. So we had to make changes, big changes, if we were to cover the world at all times or most of the times. 
it had to be, as Eric mentioned, a, a fully functional case management center, not a rep office. Uh, also, it could not be a disconnected standalone center because if the case gets allocated there, we're faced with a similar business or problems as before. Because cases always have two sides, often covering different time zones. We didn't want to pick one time zone over the other. So it had to be a fully functional case management center, but also all of our, our, all of our offices combined had to stay open around the clock and connected at all times. So in 2019, we basically went to work. And for a not-for-profit institution, we spent quite a bit of money and built a beautiful office you see there in late 2019. Sure, it looks good, um, but what you don't see is even more impressive. All of our computers and networks are connected directly to the New York server, providing the same security on our case management software. Boy, we were gonna do great things. We were gonna conquer the world. Then COVID-19 happened. So our ability to stay connected was tested to an extreme level. Employees who are generally assigned to desktop computers were issued laptops and our IT team had to stay up all night setting up hundreds of laptops. And I, I'm proud to say that I think we just might have pulled it off. You know, that picture you see there is not just a pretty virtual background for Zoom calls, it's a real office. So what does all of this mean to you as arbitration specialist? Now, this is important. When you file a case, you may receive an email from us saying that a director from our Asia Center is the case administrator. Now, when you see these cases, your case didn't get assigned or allocated to the Singapore office. Your case got assigned to the ICDR, now with a truly global coverage. You can rest assured that Mira, who just spoke to you, is on the case, and Tom, who just spoke to you, is on the case as well, and perhaps me. So let's get to mediation. Uh, at this time around, uh, we did typical rule revisions where we changed a few things and clarified and added a few things. But we also did a couple of really cool things that no one has ever done. Uh, I'll quickly go over the minor changes and Anne will tell you all about the important stuff. Um, so let me just start from the second bullet. Uh, we added video or audio language uh, to our rules and we've reframed appointment language to have some positive inference of party agreements. And the last bullet, we moved the language uh, to a place where we thought it was more consistent with the process. Stay in the next slide. And the uh, duties and uh, responsibility of the mediator is now more narrowly referenced. And uh, we create a new rule, but it's not really new, new. Uh, we just sort of separated a, a section of the rule and broken into a, a, a different section and added uh, a few uh, more languages. And the last one uh, is a provision provides that parties and the mediator consider compliance and uh, practice about our cybersecurity and privacy and data protection as we do in our arbitration rule. And for the next slide, Anne, you can take over. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. That's uh, nice of you to say that I have the most important part. And of course, we know that's not true. Uh, and Michael was very instrumental in these rules as were a number of the other people on the committee. You'll notice and that there is an emphasis on mediation within the rules. And that is because it is the International Center for Dispute Resolution as opposed to arbitration. And it in fact recognizes that the ICDR sees mediation as an important part of the toolkit for dispute resolution. Uh, rule M14, which is the termination of mediation, references the Singapore Convention and it also references other treaties as well that relate to a mediated settlements. And this is important because we realize the potential for the Singapore Convention. We're the only institution rules to make reference to the Singapore Convention. And of course it was enacted in 2018 and at the moment there are only six signatories but it is expected that that will grow. In fact, I decided that I would do an intellectual exercise 
and go back to the New York Convention, which of course was enacted in 1958, and see how many signatories they were in the same time period of three years. And the New York Convention actually only had 10 signatories in the three years. So not that great a difference. And you must also remember with the New York Convention that in fact, the United States did not even sign until 1970 and the UK 1975. So there is a possibility that this convention will grow in importance and we wanted to make certain that we included it in the rules to give the greatest flexibility for the parties possible. In addition to that, um, you'll note that our rule also not only makes reference to the Singapore Convention, but also specifically follows the language of Article 4 of the Singapore Convention, permitting the arbitrator to, excuse me, the mediator to either sign the agreement or to certify that in fact there was a mediated settlement. And this is to give the mediators themselves comfort that they may in fact in essence, insert themselves into the final solution of this case, because mediation is indeed a private um, process. And there may be some concern by some mediators that they could not put their signature on the agreement. Um, in addition, as we've talked about, we now have this idea that the party has to opt out of mediation. And if you go back to the original rules as it relates to arbitration and starting the arbitration process, one of the components that is to be in the statement of claim in the demand for arbitration is whether or not you're willing to mediate. And the same for the statement or defense or answer that you have to state whether or not you are willing to mediate. And one of the purposes of this is to bring it to the forefront for the parties to think about this alternate means of resolving their dispute. So that in the hopes that some of these matters that actually could be uh, taken care of through mediation will in fact do so. As you look at the mediation rules, you're also going to see that they are extremely robust and that in fact, they follow best practices internationally for mediation and give guidance not only to the mediator who probably is well aware of what is to be done, but also parties that may not be familiar with mediation or the manner and the process. And with that, I I'm not certain who yeah. is to go. Thank I think Eric. Yes, thank you very much, Anne. And um, with that, uh, you know, I think we would, we, we can say you've seen a number of amendments to the, uh, to the international arbitration and mediation rules that are new address issues that are um, emerging cybersecurity. We've heard about mediation. Um, we've incorporated new, new provisions regarding how arbitrators challenges should be handled. Other amendments uh, simply codify current practice. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions and uh, uh, we've, we've reviewed at least most of those to the extent we can that we received either through the Q&A or through the chat. And um, I think some of them uh, perhaps we can um, group in some ways. And in some, in some cases, the uh, questions have been answered throughout, the, throughout uh, today's program. Uh, but I will just start off talking about mediation uh, there's been a few questions about the opt-out, how it works, what the consequences are of opting out uh, if a party does so. Um, and if they opt out, is there some sort of, you know, is there a possibility of a, of, of a, a cost penalty? And just to clarify, the, the provision in the arbitration rules um, is a presumption that the parties will mediate, but any party can unilaterally opt out. And I would just also add uh, our, our domestic divisions have actually had this version of a rule, a version of this rule in place for a number of years. So organizationally, we've got a lot of experience handling this. Um, this is a, um, a, a simply a shift from uh, the, the prior set of rules, which suggested and encouraged mediation to taking the next step and really presuming that the parties will but still allowing any party to opt out. If a party opts out under the rules, there is no cost penalty. It's their right to opt out. I would just distinguish 
if there's a provision in the party's arbitration agreement that requires mediation, that might be a different issue. But if they're simply opting out because of the amendment to, to the new provision of the rule, um, there is no penalty and any party can do so unilaterally. Um, I, I, maybe I'll just pause. I wanna make sure uh, any other panelists have an observation on that. If not, um, another set of questions arose regarding electronic signatures. And the questions are along the lines of, um, is it gonna be adequate if you don't know where an award's gonna be enforced? Um, while an arbitration is proceeding, the parties might know that, but they might not as well. Uh, and then the other question that was raised is, well, what happens if a party simply just doesn't recognize electronic signatures? Um, and uh, Beata, I know, again, you were highly involved in, in promoting those amendments. And uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts you wanna share on those questions. Yeah, I think uh, first, thank you very much for uh, so many questions on this issue. And I think that it shows how important is this issue. Uh, I was experiencing recently an, an award which I was supposed to um, in, uh, enforce uh, in Poland. That was the international award uh, signed in writing and with the confirmation by the notary and with some um, additions, I must say that this is a nightmare right now for me in Poland to enforce this award in writing, in paper. Uh, I think that ICDR is right now in the forefront of these changes. I think that this is, uh, this is my basic observation that the word, arbitration word included, will go to this direction. It means that the electronic signatures will suffice for any important actions. And I think that this is um, envisaged in this ADAS regulation for the European Union and the individual regulations in other jurisdictions. Uh, I mentioned Dubai, which I uh, knew. And uh, I would like you also to turn to the uh, article which has been published. I have written an article on this problem, so I cannot really you know, uh, explore all of the uh, theoretical basis for that, but that was in the April uh, issue of the Journal of International Arbitration, uh, where I was uh, examining the uh, model law, the ancestral model law, and many countries, many jurisdictions are based on this law. So uh, I think that it is clear from that perspective that this electronic signature should suffice. But in any case, because it is a new animal in arbitration, this is really new animal, uh, there are so many uh, safeguards written into the rules. So there should be the agreement of the parties. It should be a decision of the arbitrators. And I cannot imagine that such a decision is taken without considering and consulting the parties. And the final one is the secretariat. So there is a lot of safeguards, but I think that this, this uh, would be a flexible tool right now, uh, which will respond to all new jurisdictional changes, which will be done if not done already to this direction. So I would, I would say that this is my general answer. Thank you very much, Vera. And I, I note that we are at the end of our time. I wanna, I wanna recognize that. Um, we will just quickly maybe address a couple more questions and then uh, to the time we can, we will reach out to those who proposed additional questions we haven't had an opportunity to respond to. Uh, I also wanna add that we will send out links to the rules, the, uh, the amended rules. There have been various links that have been uh, shared in the chat function as well. We'll pull that together and send out to all of the attendees, including an article uh, that uh, describes the amendments. Um, there's a few questions about publishing awards. Um, actually, I think maybe, Lewis, I'll, I'll circle around to you on, on those. Um, there was one question about third-party funding, and I wanted to note that because that is an issue that's received a fair amount of attention. And the question was, is the issue of third-party funding one um, where uh, that, that's primarily re related to disclosure uh, alone, or can it also relate to security for costs? And I do want to emphasize that the amendment in this in this provision um, 
is really intended to address conflicts of interest. Uh, we're not introducing issues regarding uh, third party funding or any other funding that may relate to a case for other reasons that may or may not be relevant. Our concern is about making sure that if there are relationships that need to be disclosed, that the parties are aware of them. Um, I also want to note, there was a question early about uh, the, the composition and representation uh, among the groups that were reviewing the rules and provided input in particular, um, that uh, arbitration is growing in Africa. Uh, and, and that uh, was, uh, did, did we have individuals from that part of the world also involved in, in review of the rules? Um, uh, we have also noted the growth in arbitration in Africa, certainly. And I think it's a part of the world that everybody uh, is um, interested in, uh, certainly at least with respect to our roster of arbitrators. Um, we are uh, adding and have added to our roster uh, individuals to make sure that that part of the world is adequately represented as well. In terms of uh, review of the rule amendments themselves, um, that largely took place uh, through the committees, uh, which also had some representation uh, from uh, those parts of the world. Um, so Lewis, if we might be able to circle around quickly on the question of awards, uh, one question is, uh, are they going to be redacted? Uh, and uh, maybe can you give more emphasis into how the process is actually going to work going forward? We're gonna provide notice to parties when a case is closed, ask them a question about publication of awards. I'll let you take it from there. Um, but first, a uh, question about redaction. Thanks, Eric. Yes, uh, well, as we know, and as I had mentioned, our users do place a premium on confidentiality. So we're gonna do our darndest to try to get them to not object and allow us to publish awards. We have a publications committee that meets monthly. We'll try to identify awards initially that we think have educational value. And we'll ask the parties at the time of transmission and remind them early on when we're having our first administrative conference call of the existence of this rule and try to get their permission. Uh, I, we do believe that we'll be helped if we show them a redacted copy of the award. So that's our initial intention. We will have guidelines in place on redacting them. Some parties may tell us that early on that it's fine and that will alleviate the need to redact them. Uh, we do know that there's a great amount of awards already out in the marketplace by uh, certain institutions uh, that have initiatives to publish awards that are already in the public domain. So this is a carve out where we might have access to these awards that have not become public and are uh, being administered pursuant to the international rules. Thank you. And I do think, again, we've got some uh, interesting questions, but we are going to have to uh, be respectful of all your time. And uh, we thank you all for attending today. Uh, thank you for the draft. Thank you to our drafting committee um, and all the attendees that are really um, present from all over the world today. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.